This is an exclusive excerpt from the Stuff File program with Peter Anthony Holder. Now, the Stuff File presents Andrew Fazekas, the Night Sky Guy. It's radio that's out of this world. Andrew Fazekas, the Night Sky Guy, is a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and author of National Geographic's Backyard Guide to the Night Sky and also National Geographic's Stargazer's Atlas, the Ultimate Guide to the Night Sky. And Andrew, we've avoided talking about the mission of the Boeing Starliner because at the time of this taping, it's a mission that has been plagued with issues right from the launch pad. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, absolutely. Boeing just doesn't seem to have luck on their side lately, have they? And we're talking about, of course, the the Starliner, their uh, spacecraft that they built under contract for NASA, right? It's a $4 billion contract to build a spacecraft that will ferry astronauts back and forth from the International Space Station. They uh, launched their first test flight carrying humans Back in early June, I think it was like June 5th. June the 5th, and yes. The whole, June 5th, and the plan was that it was going to be an eight-day mission. You know, stay on the International Space Station for about a week, basically doing a complete shakedown of their Starliner spacecraft. Yeah, the, actual, Nas- re- the actual return date was June the 13th. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't that seem like a long time ago? Yeah. So... <laughs> Yeah, so really this is a vital mission for Boeing to basically certify the spacecraft for regular operation with NASA. And, you know, you go back, NASA picked two companies to build the replacement for the space shuttle that was retired back in 2011. And that was Boeing and SpaceX. Now, SpaceX got their spaceship, Dragon, up and running in 2020. They've been sending crews taxiing to and from the space station for NASA since 2020. The problem is, is that the agency never expected that Boeing would take this long to also get up and run. And so far, all NASA's eggs in terms of taxing service has been with Elon Musk's SpaceX Dragon capsule. And they're still waiting for Boeing. And now here we are in July. The two astronauts from Starliner are still waiting on the International Space Station to come back. Yeah. And both you and I discussed this off air several times Mm -hmm. uh, and never brought it up on the show because... I don't think either one of us were overly excited about the mission through the various stages up until the launch. We were just like saying, yeah, well, we'll see if this gets off the ground kind of thing. And and it was also from a perspective of the look and the feel of Starliners, it seemed like old technology. It seemed like watching 1950s Chevrolets in Havana. Yeah, I mean, especially when you compare it to uh, SpaceX Dragon capsule that looks like something out of Space Odyssey 2001, right? I mean, it's so sleek. It's like it looks like something that Apple may have built, right? It's so sleek and 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 very ultra modern. And you've got Boeing, you know, an old school, long legacy of of aerospace building of spacecrafts, and you know, it's tried and true in some respects. It's a great old design and i'm sure it's filled with a lot of more modern technology but still it just you know i think we've been tainted as the public looking at it of of seeing what great successes spacex is doing what it looks like how they market and promote their themselves and boeing undergoing so many difficulties, trials and tribulations regarding their jetliner, you know, their Boeing fiascos, the jet plane disasters that they've, they've, they've been dealing with, PR disasters. And then, of course, these constant delays and problems, these technical issues that keep cropping up with their Starliner spacecraft. It just paints the whole thing in a very different light, I think, for the public. And we just, you know, the enthusiasm isn't there. And I think it's okay in the sense of safety that they 
they are doing their due diligence. NASA is now taking a more overriding view in their partnership and more uh, prog- they're more progressive in their oversight, which is great for safety. But still, it just doesn't have that confidence with the public. The, you know, we just don't, they've lost a lot of creds, I think, with, with the public uh, Boeing has. And, and again, we've talked about this for years. When we first saw the design of the uh, Starliner, uh, I think both of us said, isn't this just a, a bulked up rehash of the Apollo capsule? Absolutely. It does look very, harkens back so much. I mean, like I said, the overall design is tried and true. But then you see what SpaceX has done in terms of taking that to the next level. It doesn't seem like Boeing has really done that. And it's, it, it does look like a clunker compared to <laughs> what, what SpaceX has. And I think the expect, because SpaceX got out of the gate now literally four years ago in starting operations, actually ferrying astronauts, taxiing them. Um, We're like, that's what the public is expecting. So the bar was set very high, I think, uh, in terms of expectations for Boeing, and they just haven't been able to meet that level. Well, let's move on from uh, the Starliner and its visit to the International Space Station and talk about another space station that isn't up there yet, but... There is NASA's Gateway Space Station, which is planned for a lunar orbit, and Canada has already begun work on the Canada Arm 3, which is going to be part of that space station. Yeah, this is amazing for Canada. It's uh, it's a contract worth over a billion dollars, Canadian, and it's pivotal, critical, can't understate this, to the success of what uh, is going to be part of the human's return to the moon. And it's not just a a quick jaunt to the moon like we did in in, in, in Apollo, but there to work and stay long term. And with that whole scenario that NASA is planning with their Artemis mission, they want to have a support system in the form of a lunar orbiting space station. It won't be permanently occupied like the International Space Station orbiting the Earth. It'll be there as a drop-off point, a stop-off point for astronauts on their way to and from the surface of the moon. It's called Gateway. It's supposed to come online in 2029, so in about five years. It's delayed. There's been a lot of delays, but right now it's scheduled to go into operation in five years. And it will be outfitted with this new generation Canada arm, very similar to what we've seen on the International Space Station, which was Canada arm two. And of course, the first generation being on the space shuttle fleet, the famous Canada arm that put out, you know, grabbed satellites and and such. This one is going to be Uh, really a 21st century version of it. It's about 28 feet long, multiple joints, outfitted with artificial intelligence. It has to work autonomously because this robot, robotic arm, is going to be pivotal in building the space station that it will be attached to and also eventually doing the work of grabbing satellites to and from that are going to be visiting as they're being shuttled between our two worlds, Earth and the Moon. And so Canada is uh, right now in the phase of of building this 28-foot robotic arm and outfitting it so that it can autonomously work. So there'll be times when the space station will be not occupied by humans, and this robotic arm will have to help maintain the gateway space station, like things like changing out batteries and uh, scientific instruments, things like that. It needs to work autonomously because you have to remember, Peter, it's going to be about 400,000 kilometers away from us. And so there's no chance of a quick visit by astronauts uh, to do repairs. It'll have to be able to do that on its own. Now, will this satellite, will this space station rather, will this be in in orbit or will it be stationary above the the moon's surface yeah so it'll it'll actually that's a good question it's going to actually be in a uh in orbit around the moon 
And, the, you know, they haven't released all the details of exactly how that's going to all work out. But the idea is that it's kind of like a, a safe spot for astronauts that are traveling between and a, and a kind of a, a waypoint, a transfer station, as you can you can imagine, between the surface of the moon and the Earth. It's going to be occupied for brief amounts of times as the astronauts are, are leaving or going to, to, to the moon. Well, the reason why I asked the question is you talk about the fact that the Canada arm has to be autonomous and is, is one of the reasons being that, again, as you say, it won't be constantly manned, but also there is a lack of communication on the far side of the moon. Absolutely. So if it is orbiting the moon, which uh, looks like it will be, there'll be times where it will be out of contact, potentially, with Earth. But I think things are going to be changing. It shows already they're, they're thinking about this. So there, there, are, there is no kind of dead space in terms of communication around the moon by putting you know, having satellites around, communication satellites around the moon. This is a huge, you know, endeavor that they're thinking of because of if we want humans to permanently occupy the surface of the moon, we need to make sure that there is always backup communications. Also, if there's any assets on the dark side of the moon, on the far side that never uh, is facing the earth, we want to make sure those regions also have the ability to communicate. There are already a couple of satellites like that. Even China has their uh, own satellite. Uh, they recently had a, a sample return from the far side of the moon, and they were able to stay in contact with their rover by using satellites that were orbiting the moon. So these kind of communications to satellites that we, we rely on here on Earth, uh, we want to replicate in a more modest form, obviously, but around the moon that allows us to have 24-hour communication. So that kind of might, that kind of uh, issue might just go away in the next decade. Well, speaking of satellites, I also wanted to talk about satellites um, uh, doing damage to the ozone layer. And also, uh, speaking of satellites, the fact that the ISS astronauts had to uh, safely shelter from an errant satellite. But we are out of time. So... Can we go to Patreon and do this as a Patreon reward extra? Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay, sir. Clear skies. Andrew Fazekas, the night sky guy. You can go to our website at thestuffile.com to the page for this show, which is show number 0779, and you'll find links to Andrew's site to get your own personal autographed copy of his books. And Patreon subscribers, you can hear more of Andrew as a Patreon reward extra, where we'll discuss some problems with satellites, both the damage they can cause while orbiting and the damage they can cause to our atmosphere when their orbit is over. Just go to our Patreon page, and if you're not already a member, become one of the select patrons of the show. Visit patreon.com slash the stuff file program. You've just heard an exclusive excerpt from the stuff file program with Peter Anthony Holder. To hear any or all of the full hour long shows, visit the stuff file.com. Stuff is spelled S T U P H. That's the stuff file.com. A presentation of Flying Fish Communications.